Hello everyone, my name is Pamela Brooks. I am the mother of Amir Damani Brooks. Amir was a charming, lovely young man. He loved to um, ride skateboards, he loved to box, he loved baseball, and his biggest thing, he was a good drummer. He played in many bands throughout the Washington, D.C. area, and he was self-taught on all this stuff. So he was a special little guy. And he was a charmer, first of all. He was very char he was a charmer. And very handsome, I might add. He um for a long time Amir was very short. My mom is tall, and my dad is short. They've been together, they were together a long time. So my mother said, Why are these kids gonna take after your dad? And Amir was very short for a long time. I was like, not one of mine. <laughs> but at, like when he became like 16, 17, he was got up to 6'3. He's overnight drill spur. But I want to keep on from because of time. Um, I remember back in July 2014, I saw Mr. Carter on the news, and I was like, I prayed for her because I can never imagine being in the shoes that she was in. And I was like, I can imagine losing my child like that, and and to law enforcement at that. A little do I know, three weeks later, I was going to be walking in the same shoes as her. And it also happened three days before Michael Brown was killed, three months before Tamir Rice was killed all in 2014. Um, the imminent death of my son, I mean, the Im imminent occurrence was on August the 4th, 2014. I was driving and I received a call from my daughter. She was screaming in the phone to get to Washington Hospital Center because my, young, my youngest son, Amir, was in a bad accident and I needed to get to the hospital immediately. I was in complete shock, believing, couldn't believe what I was hearing and nobody could have prepared me for what I heard when I got to the hospital. They said, Ms. Brooks, your son was in a very bad accident and it doesn't look good. My baby was hurting and an array of thoughts flooded my mind. How can my son be in surgery fighting for his life when he was so full of, full of life a few hours ago? Why would doctor tell me my son's, uh, my son's heart had stopped at the scene? How could my son have bled out so bad he received 50 pints of blood when he got to the hospital? How could this how could it be that my baby boy may not survive? The doctors told me there was nothing else they could do for my son, but he was on life support for two days. He was fighting, he was trying to hold on, and I, and I was praying that he could. I, I, I told the doctors, I cannot take my son off life support. If he was to go, it would be in God's hands, not in mine. That was the worst day of my life. Numbness and disbelief settled in. I couldn't comprehend the overwhelming news there is no way to prepare the emotional trauma, nor the change in life that follows the loss of your child. I remember crying out to God, asking him, why was this happening to us? I asked myself time and time again, why God allowed this tragedy to happen? There were thousands of people praying for my son for his recovery, and yet he did not survive. I had to re realize that our prayers would end, result in God's will being answered and not our own. Amir's life on this earth ended on August 6, 2014. But little did I know at the time, it was at the, it was at the hands of law enforcement. I just thought my son was in a dirt bike crash. After my son's death, the vehicular homicide unit came to the hospital and sat me down and said, your son was chased on a dirt bike by off-duty Prince George's County, Maryland police officer. They suspected my son of being involved in a robbery, which happened eight weeks prior to this chase. During the chase, the dispatch called the dirt bike in, supposed dirt, stolen the dirt bike in, and they gave a description of it. He gave, the police officer gave a description of the bike, and the police dispatch told them that was the bike they were looking for to fall back. He continued to chase my son on the median of the highway, to going towards incoming traffic, one mile out of Maryland, another mile in the DC. The, the, the cop uh, crossed jurisdiction, and keep in mind, he was off duty. So he, and um, Amir's cousin was also on the bike. He survived this crash, but he, he was, thank God, he was here to tell us the story. And he also said this, this officer was bumping the back of my son's bike. And Amir, unfortunately, he crashed. He lost control of the bike and crashed. This, pu this police officer saw it, and the whole thing was caught on tape. The officer pulled up to the scene, and he saw my son, who was gravely injured, because his femur, his back was broke, his neck was broke, every bone on the right side of his head was crushed. His femur bone was completely out of his leg. And he um, he bled out, but he was holding, but they, he was holding on, he was still alive. 
and it's caught on tape that this police officer, it shows this police officer pulling up to the scene, looking at my son on the ground, pulling off and leaving him there. I think the biggest problem that I had with this whole thing that he, even if you if you were right or wrong, help my son. Who's to say that maybe you applied pressure, my son may have survived. We don't know that because you didn't do it. But he went back at, and he was working at the time in the apartment complex I lived in. He was working part time. He kind of do the little moonlighting like Mary's um, case. He went back to the apartment complex, log on the log sheet, um, chased her bike, but bike fled into D.C. Period. How about you chase the bike in the D.C., you left him there, you didn't help him, he was hurt. None of that was, none, they were told none of that until I told them. Nothing was done to this police officer, just like in many cases. He was on death duty for a couple days and nothing was done to him. My son, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking like all these parents that I mean over and over through the years, we all, you might get a couple of convictions, which is, one conviction is a, is a lot, for, that's, that's a conviction for all of us. But there need to be more convictions these police officers need to be held accountable. And one thing they do not need to be doing, if they get if they um, get terminated for misconduct, don't hire them nowhere else. They should not be hired anywhere else as a police officer or any kind of law enforcement capacity. Because we're lo losing too many brown and black young men and the women out here with no accountability. And I, and I, I just, I can go on and on, but I know I'm, for time, I'm gonna keep going. But you have to, you have to hold these, um, police officer accountable. And I'm also a member of the Coalition of Concerned Mothers. I'm the director of community outreach. I'm also the founder of the No Chase Movement, which I founded after my son's untimely death. I became a certified grief coach after my son's death because so many mothers throughout the country was reaching out to me to talk to them. So I said, hmm, I can help them and I can help myself in the process. I also became a mentor for SONG, which is Saving Our Next Generation. It's a youth, um, it's a youth group in Washington, D.C. I go to the youth detention center two times a week and talk to the children that are inmates. So I try to keep myself busy. And, I, and a lot of times I bring up my son's story because I tell those kids, y'all have a second chance. My son didn't have a second chance. So if you don't do nothing else, live for him. But again, we have to hold these police officers accountable. You have to get a proper training, especially for the mental health side. They definitely need training for that. And just hold them accountable. That's all I can say.